Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this online presentation of the book of Elena Grillo, Parliamentary Oversight of the Executives, Tools and Procedures in Europe. The event is sponsored by the School of International Governance from the European University Institute, and I am Carlos Closa, part-time professor at the school. And we are very happy to host this event. Uh, Elena is currently a um, fellow at the School of International Governance, and she possesses a very privileged position to discuss the issues. She combines the practical dimension of being a senior parliamentary officer at the Senate of Italy, but also a professor at the Louis University in Rome. And uh, taking this advantage, she has produced a conceptually rich book with a lot of interesting insights and a very well documented uh, book with a huge bibliography. Uh, and you can see when you read through it that is, this is the the, uh, the work of, uh, of many years and uh, the, the, the biography takes more than 10 pages. So it's, it's really remarkable. And that shows that Elena has really mastered the, the, the subject. In order to discuss the book and the uses that the book raises more broadly, we have two distinguished scholars with us. Uh, on, the, on, on one hand, we have uh, Borvan Bessels, who is part-time professor at the School of International Governments and also visiting professor at the College of Europe in, in Bruges in Natolin, and director of the Center for Turkey and European Union Studies at the University of Cologne. Until 2016, she was a chairperson of the Executive Board of the Trans-European Policy Studies Association based in Brussels. And he was previously a member of the high-level group of the European Commission for the reform of the Common Foreign Security Policy and for the revision of the Treaty of Maastricht. And uh, he has got a huge extended experience uh, in researching on the parliaments and uh, European integration. And then we have also Didi Cartin, who is director of the Center for Judicial Cooperation at the Robert Schuman Center, also the European University Institute. And she previously holds the chair of European, of European Law and Governance at the, European, at the University of Amsterdam. And previously she holds chairs in European International Governance Law and International Law of International Organizations at the University of Utrecht. She's also an elected member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and a laureate of the Spinoza Prize by the Dutch Scientific Organization. Now, let me say a few things uh, about uh, the book before I turn to our, our uh, speakers. Uh, parliamentary oversight, as Elena makes clear, is a very specific European institution. In fact, uh, Europe is an island as far as political regions are concerned. In America, Africa, and Asia, presidential systems dominate with very few sections. We can think of Japan and Korea, for instance. And Oceania is also a second island of parliamentarism. And of course, parliamentary oversight is a notion and set of institutions that does not fit well with presidential system. And some of the things we are seeing now in the United States uh, deeply prove this, um, this intuition. I think that Elena is going to elaborate much more about the European uh, really characteristic uh, dimension of uh, parliamentary oversight. So just let me mention a few things about the second part of the book. The book is, is made of two parts. The first part is uh, theoretical and conceptual. And the second part uh, are a selected number of cases around policy, policy areas, policy fields. And Elena has selected three of those areas, foreign affairs, European constitutional dimension, and the budget. And each of them raises questions that I, I want to, to put forward already for uh, later on in the Q&A, but uh, since I am the, the first one introducing the topic, I take this, this opportunity. First, foreign policy is the traditional domain for executive action. And we can here remember uh, the federative power of John Locke, that uh, he, in his structure of government, reserved for the executive. Elena Riley points out that the role of parliaments result for the successful grabbing of powers through years, even though significant discretion for executives still remain. And Elena concentrates in this very interesting chapter on the difference between ex ante and sports control and illustrate this with examples to a number of uh, jurisdictions, a significant number of jurisdictions. And see modules the discussion on parliamentary control on foreign policy with the introduction of uh, the core. The, the question that I, I had when, when reading this chapter is uh, a kind of, uh, um, forgive me to be so political science uh, mind, uh, how typical this policy is for inferring about parliamentary oversight. But because certainly foreign policy is a very specific policy domain and one that traditionally has been in the hands of the executives, right? So how much we can infer about the position of parliaments by looking at 
foreign policy. The second chapter uh, in this set of cases deals with the European, what Elena calls the European Union constitutional dimension. And here she's looking at the parliamentary oversight, the fragmented executive. And uh, in this dual construction, the executive concerns both the Commission and the national executive. My expectation when, uh, when reading the chapter is that the focus will be on the two fragments of the executive, the Commission and the Arms, but Elena chooses to focus on the agents, uh, both the European Parliament and national parliaments. And in line with the scholarships, Elena identifies and lends less than satisfactory situation, even with uh, interparliamentary comparison brought into the picture. So my question here is a much broader one and uh, speak about what are the complexities of, our, of oversight in a multi-level system? And that having to account that there are some gaps which are particularly relevant. For instance, one gap that relates also to the next uh, chapter refers to the capacity of national parliaments to control the commission, something which is very relevant in, the, in budgetary powers. And the budget precisely is the third, the third chapter on, of this set of empirical chapter in which Elena discusses parliamentary oversight uh, around three models, uh, United Kingdom, France, and Italy. And she also adds the European Parliament. And uh, this last addition, I think, is totally justified given the large budgetary powers that the European has acquired in the field. Here, I will have expected a much longer discussion of uh, some of the specific uh, elements of uh, macroeconomic and fiscal governance of the European at the European level, particularly the European semester or the European stability mechanism, and even the different memorandums of understandings signed it, uh, during the crisis. Those provide a huge number of uh, referent uh, elements in which to test the capacity of parliaments to scrutinize the action of uh, government. And the other issue in which I would like to be the chapter a little more poignant, I would like to hear uh, Elena's view, is the relationship between European and national parliaments, which is not necessarily always cooperative. And I can think that specifically in this domain, uh, there is some kind of uh, small suspicion between the two, uh, the, the two bodies. And uh, one thing that probably Elena is going to tell us something now is about the, the perspective for the future in relation to the new recovery and resilient facility. Uh, my question summarizing the, 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 the elements of this chapter is how much uh, has the European Union macroeconomic and fiscal governance empower executives and release them from the parliamentary side? This is a very classical thesis in the early years of European integration that argued that uh, European integration permitted executives to release themselves from the control of parliament. So there was a kind of translation of power from the parliaments to the to the uh, to the executives how much is this true looking at, at at the at the budget so this is a very basic overview of the of the more empirical part of the chapter and now i give the floor uh, to elena who is going to concentrate i think more in the conceptual and theoretical uh, dimension so elena the floor is yours. yes thank you very much thank you carlos for this introduction and thank you also to David Curtin and Wolfgang Wessels uh, for bringing their invaluable voice to, to this book presentation. Uh, it is truly a honor for me uh, to discuss this book at the European University Institute. And I'm grateful to the School of Transnational Government, to Fabrizio Tassinari, who unfortunately can't be here today, and to Holy Staff for the great support in organizing this event. Uh, as Carlos was mentioning, it's not easy to, to summarize in a few minutes presentation the thoughts and reflections that, on the issue that has been on my bedside table, I would say, for over six years. But what I would like to do today is simply to guide you to the process of research that has featured my approach to the topic, I'm trying to emphasize the distinctive nature that parliamentary oversight reveals in the European Union. And to do this, I will structure my presentation in three parts. Uh, first of all, the added value that a comparative and European perspective offers to the understanding of parliamentary oversight. Uh, second, the impact of the EU integration on the manifold dimensions 
of parliamentary oversight, and I will come here to the question raised by Carlos on the European semester. And third and last, the main challenges that parliaments are facing in the oversight domain. Uh, at this stage, I will um, probably have some references to the COVID pandemic, which are not really in the book because I delivered it before the pandemic started. Uh, times are long with, <laughs> uh, with the publishers. But uh, anyway, I've tried to cover them in mo more recent publication. I think that uh, they give a nice picture of the challenges at stake. So uh, starting from the first point on the added value or how you comparative perspective on the issue. Uh, I, I believe that a, a personal always uh, almost uh, biographical imprint uh, moves the choice of the issue of a monographic work. And uh, in my case, I have decided to study parliamentary oversight because I have always found it hard to understand what this function concretely is about. Um, the constitutional theory says that parliamentary oversight is one essential mechanism for limiting and at the same time sharing, uh, sharing executive power. So it is part of the widest sphere of constitutional controls whose aim is to keep government within its limits. But at, on the other hand, in parliamentary forms of government, which of course are the rule in Europe, uh, it works within the confidence relationship and it unfolds not just to the intimation or application of a sanction, but also to the positive hack of participating in government action by influencing, dissuading, or persuading the government. So this double conception of parliamentary oversight as a limit and as a means for influence becomes increasingly complex if we consider that in parliamentary systems, oversight identifies a paradox. Uh, it is the paradox of a parliamentary majority that is expected to control its own executive. And this makes the oversight function in parliamentary systems not fully comparable to the experience of presidential systems. Although, and I will try to demonstrate this in a while, the European Union is mixing mechanisms derived from both systems. So uh, the, the peculiar feature of the European experience lies in the constructive dialogue between different constitutional traditions of parliamentary oversight. And this is a, in a certain way a softened the original paradox. On the one hand, we have the Napoleonic tradition which permeates many countries in continental Europe and which has historical shaped parliamentary oversight having in mind the idea of administrative control. It's a relationship based on verification and censure. So the stress is placed on the role of parliament, the controller, which has direct legitimacy, and who has the power and authority of the control. Well, uh, on the other hand, the Westminster tradition looks uh, parliamentary oversight in quite a different manner uh, because it frames, frames it within the accountability discourse. Accountability, as we all know, is an amorphous concept uh, it does not find translations in most uh, uh, other European languages, but its main implication is the conceptualization of the oversight function in terms, uh, not in terms of parliamentary authority, but as the duty of the government to answer before parliament. The executive must be answerable uh, to parliament, not, in, not just in a procedural, but also in a substantial way, which means that the government needs to give explanation for the policies selected and to account for these policies. So these are two rather different ways of conceiving the same function. And it's interesting to, to note that they are mirrored in the use of language because uh, in many European countries, we have one single word, which is control in Italia, control in Spanish, control in, in German uh, to, to, to identify this function. And these terms derive from the French control uh, which uh, identifies in its original meeting, meaning uh, a double entry bookkeeping where one entry is used to check the other. So this really gives the, the image of the administrative notion uh, of control from the Napoleonic tradition. Uh, by contrast, in English, we have three words that we use. We have oversight, we have scrutiny, we have control. In the book, I try to, to, to give a count of the differences between them. But the point is that the term scrutiny, which is used in the Westminster tradition, identifies the act of observing 
uh, or examining something not to uh, impose a sanction, but mainly to formulate an informed judgment. So I think that the comparative analysis demonstrates that parliamentary oversight, which is one cornerstone of representative democracy in Europe, is at the same time one dimension where different constitutional traditions coexist. And the cross fertilization started long before the European Union um, was created, but it has been accelerated with the European integration. Uh, the European Union architecture in itself has incorporated elements of verification and censure that are typical to continental Europe and elements of accountability derived from the Westminster tradition. But what's significant is that the hybridization has gone further uh, because the EU has also derived uh, other regulatory patterns from presidential regimes uh, based on instances of red democracy, on evaluation of public policies, I'm thinking of the role of petitions, of transparency rules and consultation, the relationship with agencies and so forth. So uh, acting as a sort of a laboratory, the EU has managed to integrate and complement rather different patterns of uh, democratic and regulatory oversight. And this hybridization has affected not just the European governance, but also national levels. And this is the first reason why I believe that studying parliamentary oversight in the European experience offers a much richer view of the multifaceted aspects of this function. But there's another reason, um, and the second reason is related to the unprecedented impact that the European constitutional dimension has produced on the identity or role of the two main subjects of the um, oversight relationship, the controller and the controlled. Um, this change has affected both the European and the national level, and this explains why in a certain way, the, the European dimension has softened the original paradox uh, of, of, of parliamentary oversight in parliamentary systems. Well, let's focus on the side of the controller, uh, the executive branch. It has been significantly argued, and I think that we really hold this intuition to, to, to the leader curtain that the executive using the singular does not exist anymore, that the executive dimension can only be referred to in the plural, uh, to the formula of the fragmented EU governments, which comprise supranational bodies, such as the European Commission, intergovernmental institutions, such as the Council and the European Council, independent territories, and other less formalized bodies, such as the Eurogroup, the Euro summits, or whatever. So many of these institutions are more or less directly participated by national executives, which means that national parliaments have now more subjects to oversee. They don't just have their own executive, but they have indirectly also executives at the European level. And that's why at a certain point of my research, I decided to, to change the book, the title of the book from parliamentary oversight of the executive in the singular to parliamentary oversight of the executives in the plural. And I also hold this intuition to Professor Manzel. I really want to thank him for, for, for widening my perspective of analysis. Um, and uh, therefore, in the review, the, 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 the oversight scheme becomes increasingly complex and diffuse. Uh, in the chapter on parliamentary oversight of the EU, relying on some previous work by Volcan Vessels, uh, I try to explain how the EU identifies multiple circuits of parliamentary oversight not necessarily based on the confidence scheme. Uh, these circuits are not perfectly closed. And that's why, I mean, we still have recurring arguments on the democratic deficit or disconnect of the European Union. But I think that I will leave this point for debate. Um, I would rather move to, to the second point, uh, which considers how participation in the European Union as affecting the coexisting dimension of parliamentary oversight that uh, shaped the trend. Uh, in the monograph, I analyze different categories of parliamentary oversight, but here I would like to focus on two binomials, that of ex-ante and exposed oversight and of soft and hard oversight. Well, on the first binomial, um, I believe that participation in the European Union has stressed the capacity of parliaments to use the oversight function 
in order to follow the entire process of the executive decision making at the national and at the European level. Uh, generally speaking, parliaments use oversight tools in the follow up procedures that aim governments uh, uh, at holding governments to account for past action. So this is the exposed mechanism, but they also use oversight tools to exercise ex ante and influence on the government. And uh, the mechanisms may change, but the function performed by parliaments is the same. And this explains why uh, parliamentary oversight is a sort of a cyclical function which follows the entire decision-making process. And uh, of course, at member states level, uh, parliaments have different preferences towards ex-ante and exposed mechanisms, which may change from one policy area to the other and may also change over time. So uh, in the book, I try to, to, to give count of this, but what I would like to stress also answering to Carlos' questions is that the European Union has surely strengthened the ex-ante dimension of parliamentary oversight in all member states. And I think that participation in the European semester is really one example of this. I mean, it has strengthened the capacity of parliament to uh, address political directions to the horn governments before budgetary law is presented to parliament. And this was not, I mean, really the practice in many national parliaments. So it's an innovation which significantly the, 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 the two pack and the six pack have almost, I would, would not say imposed, but as suggested to parliaments. Uh, I mean, this is one of the first uh, pieces of legislation of the European Union, which say something about the executive legislative interaction at the national level. And it's really a, a novelty, I would say. And many national parliaments have, of course, tried to, to, to follow up to this, to, to, to this, uh, to this provision. But another example, of course, is the, uh, the other ex ante mechanisms developed at member states level to address directions to the governments before they take decisions in the Council or in the European Council. Uh, and I'm referring to the uh, attempt to, to, to introduce a sort of mandate, which is not legally binding, of course, as in the experience of the Folketing, the Danish Folketing or the Swedish Rick Sat Bastille, I mean, enables many parliaments to engage in a sort of a two level games, uh, if you want to use Padnam words, uh, where, um, I mean, it's difficult to, to, to see uh, whether uh, national concerns hand and whether, uh, I mean, in, in this uh, ex-ante hacks, uh, um, MPs also uh, melt national concerns with European concerns. But I think that, uh, um, this really uh, um, identifies uh, the, the relevance uh, of these ex ante tools uh, um, in the European dialogue and in the national political dialogue. So it's really a two level game. And the second binomial is that of hard and soft oversight. Hard oversight works through the hierarchical procedures that enable parliament to trigger legally binding sanctions to address government responsibility. Soft oversight is instead uh, uh, interpreted as a more horizontal dimension, which serves parliament's attempt to, to exercise an influence to non-binding tools. So, of course, I mean, the possibility to overthrow the government is the hill to bite weapon in the parliament's armory. Uh, although, I mean, I mean, Italy is right now, I mean, experiences in, in a quite hard situation on, under this ground. But anyway, uh, it's the practice of soft oversight that moves the, the, the legislative executive daily interaction. And most than anything else, the software mechanisms are, are the art of the EU constitutional experience where we are lacking a confidence mechanism at the European level, but we are also lacking a confidence relationship between national parliaments and uh, the bodies of the, uh, of the EU fragmented executives. So, I mean, that's why, I mean, the European Union favors the soft mechanisms and this in its turn has influenced national traditions. And I just would like to mention a relevant decision by the Spanish Constitutional Tribunal in 2018, um, which states that not all oversight tools need to find the purpose in the breaking of the confidence relationship, because in principle, they can also be exercised when such a relationship is, is lacking. 
So, I mean, I think really it's a pivotal decision. And another example of the mutual influence is that in this domain, the national and the European constitutional dimensions are experiencing. And I will now move to the third and last point of my presentation, which is about current challenges. Well, I, I will address this point by referring to a current pandemic, which is in my view has been an accelerator of processes which were already underway in the executive legislative uh, uh, relationship. On the one hand, the pandemic uh, has accelerated and intensified uh, the process of executive dominance in lawmaking, but at the same time, it has accelerated and intensified the capacity of parliaments to work uh, on, in the non-legislative sphere and to use the oversight demand rather than the legislative function. And I will mention four main challenges that parliament have begun to face in the COVID emergency and the ground of, of the oversight which of course, I mean, they pre-exist to, to, to the pandemic, as I was mentioning. So the first uh, is about uh, ex-ante oversight, which can be a powerful tool available to parliaments when lawmaking is either, uh, is either not feasible or um, it is better performed by executives uh, for technical reasons. Um, in the pandemic, I believe that through the oversight function, parliaments have been able to gain back spheres of influence in the areas that are outside the remit. I'm thinking of statutory instruments. Statutory instruments have been the dominant response of the executives uh, under the COVID emergency. And parliaments have done a lot to try to, to extend the oversight scope to these tools. Uh, the second, and I think that the recovery plan might offer um, some significant trends in this direction. I think that really it's through accented tools that Parliament uh, will get the possibility to get involved in the recovery plan. The second point is how to maximize the, the political effectiveness of the oversight, uh, of the soft oversight machinery. Um, oversight and specifically oversight and committee and being the dominant response of parliaments in the COVID, especially in the first wave of the pandemic, when they have invested in committee work, fact finding, seeking of evidence. Uh, and this has provided uh, citizens with more transparency, more debate, more information. But in the second wave, uh, oversight in the plenary has been discovered in order to strengthen parliaments to have a say on key political decision. And I'm referring to two uh, milestone decisions. The first is the resolution of the European Parliament on the multi-annual plans of framework and on resources decision, which changes the face of uh, financial autonomy in the European Union. And second, and the second is the resolution of the Polish Senate against the veto posed by the Polish executive on the own resources decision, which starts a strong competition between the two powers. The third is access to information and scientific evidence as a prerequisite for effective parliamentary oversight. Uh, I believe that the pandemic has shown very uh, clearly that oversight requires time, expertise, reliable and independent information and analytical resources. Uh, I believe that access to scientific advice has become a main concern for many legislators. So to support parliamentary oversight, we need to work not just on the transparency of parliaments, but also on the transparency of governments, which is another, an, the other um, phase of the medal. Um, limiting the information asymmetries between the two branches is really a precondition. The fourth and last challenge is uh, uh, about exposed oversight, which is strategic, and yet it is the weakest perspective in Europe, I believe. Uh, in the last few years, the European Parliament has invested significant resources on post-legislative scrutiny, um, but many national parliaments still don't have the same capacities. Um, and in the pandemic, I am missing the real debate on parliamentary exposed control of executive measures and uh, on their prerogatives in the rollback of the emergency legislation. There's a significant uh, exception in the, European, in, the, in the British experience, uh, which has uh, introduced a new mechanism for the post-legislative scrutiny of statutory instruments. But I think that in a normative perspective, uh, we really need to invest more in this. 
So uh, uh, I really don't think to have conclusions at this stage, uh, but there's some point to, that I would like to just to mention in the very end that to, to capture the gains of the oversight function, I believe that national parliaments and member states level have much to learn from the European parliaments. And that's also the other answer to, to Carlos' point, probably, because with the rules and practices, national parliamentary traditions have supported the strengthening of the European parliament vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch. But at this stage, uh, the process can partially be reverted um, the, over the decades, the European Parliament has shown a distinctive capacity to perform parliamentary oversight as a unitary institution, fighting to defend its own prerogatives against the executive bodies. And this has often been done by uh, cross-cutting uh, uh, the cleavages between political groups. And we know from parliamentary theory that uh, uh, parliamentary oversight changes in stages, phases if, if it is performed by the majority, the opposition, or if it is cross party. But what I assume today is that parliaments need to invest more on their capacity to perform the oversight function in a cross party mode as a single institution. And this is particularly true when excesses in the executive dominance risk compromising the basic role. So the rediscovering beyond cooperative spirit, uh, which is inherent to the confidence relationship also forms of cooperation between powers. But I think that I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. And I give the floor back to, to, to Carlos Closa. Looking forward to, to, to hearing your comments. Thank you, Lena. Thank you very much for a very engaging way of launching the, the, the work. And, and of course, even if you don't have uh, conclusions, we always have preliminary, some preliminary uh, conclusions and insights that we can explore later on. Before I, I pass the floor to our two speakers today, just let me remind you that you can raise your questions in two ways you can you can do it through the QA button at the end of the at the bottom of the page or you can raise your virtual hand and ask for the floor to make them orally. Whatever option you prefer, we will take it, right? So you have now three questions, but we'll take them after after the intervention of the speaker. So let's now move to Paul Van and, uh, and Deirdre. Paul Van, please, the floor is yours. Congratulations. I think this is an impressive empirical work, well-structured and giving many insights and suggestions for further research. Let me make some remarks what I think are the added value. And of course, this is biased by my own research on national parliaments and European parliament in relation with the multi-level system. And it's also the task of a stakeholder group, which we have at the School of Transnational Governance, which looks at this issue, how national parliaments can really work in transnational governance. A major issue, I think, for everybody, and a question also for populist parties. I have five points. First point would be uh, that uh, it's very interesting to look at your categorizations. And I recommend all readers to look at page 201, because there you have a very nice list of uh, different findings based on confidence building. And you mentioned a couple of times in your presentation the term of uh, soft oversight. And I think that's a major issue. And I come back to that. So let's say if you want to compare national parliaments over the European Parliament, uh, you can use, we as a researcher could use this categorization on page 201. I think that's important. Second uh, point is the national parliaments and European integration. This is for a long time a major research area for many of us, but we get additional insights. And uh, sometimes it's good to also see if let's say our former uh, analysis have been confirmed or not. What I see there is that um, national parliaments, at least as far as we see it, quite often are not very engaged. One of the indicators is the so-called early warning system with the yellow card and the orange card, which is practically, uh, I think there was now within the 10 or 11 years that this exists, I think two cases uh, where uh, everybody got to the yellow card, not even to the um, orange card. Uh, so it's indicating. When I talk to members of the parliament in the country I know best, in the Committee on European Affairs, they tell me, why should we get involved in making concrete suggestions in a legislative process uh, where there are so many actors, we don't know 
if there's an effect at all. And perhaps more important, and I come back to that, uh, we are pretty certain that we get well informed by the government, even the opposition uh, parliamentarians said, in our committee, we know what is happening. We raise our issues. So we think we are somehow involved. Of course, not always in these cases, we are of course, also disappointments, but let's say as a general feeling, this kind of informal, you might call it perhaps soft, uh, is quite effective, apparently. Now, I don't know exactly how it works in other countries. I would say, especially in smaller countries, this might be very important because people just know each other. In larger countries like France, Germany, let's say people, uh, parliamentarians meet perhaps for the first time in their life. In smaller countries, they have met uh, before in studies, at schools, at football clubs, wherever. So that's my second point. Why are these uh, national parliaments not very active in what they are offered? There is a political dialogue by the commission, which is used, but you don't get the impression that it's very much uh, used. I can also say there are, of course, exceptions. There is a case in the financial crisis for the Euro where the European Council, <laughs> the summit, was interrupted between Sunday and, and Wednesday. Why? Because Mrs. Merkel had to go home back to get the agreement of the Bundestag for the uh, financial instruments. And she went to all parliamentary groups explaining her uh, policies and why she thought this was needed. So let's say I would, this is an exception, I guess, but I would take that serious. And uh, Mrs. Merkel, as Chancellor, always makes a governmental statement before each European Council meeting. Of course, the effect how far national uh, or the national parliaments then can have an impact on what she is telling uh, in Brussels is limited. Uh, what we know, because we don't know exactly what happens inside the European Council meetings. Uh, but I think we should be aware there is a whole range of different ways, and you mentioned a couple of them. The third point is European Parliament. Um, and uh, you mentioned, I think that's very helpful and a task for our research now, very much the ongoing pandemic crisis and the management of it by the European Council. Uh, and I only can reinforce you, I do my own studies on that, which is very difficult to be frank, who is involved, where, what are the provisions? Let's say for outside observers, it's a complicated and complex issue. But my guess would be the European Parliament, if you look back, has played a larger role at the end now um, than we in between in July perhaps thought. Uh, this is due to the fact that the European Parliament has a veto on the, uh, on re, uh, on the multi-annual financial framework, uh, expenditure side, uh, and of course, it was very strong in the rule of law conditionality, which was also important. So I think we, sh we should have a second look at the European Parliament in comparison with the European Council. And let's say I'm doing some research on that, hope to get along and perhaps we can find the proper way to exchange our uh, views on that and get people involved who are, let's say, doing the business, who are real actors. So that would be my third point. The fourth point, is about cooperation among national parliaments. You mentioned that a couple of times. And of course, let's say looking from my own expectations, that's very frustrating. Because we thought that, uh, let's say the European Council and the Council are multi-level players. I mean, they are national heads. They have a strong voice inside their countries. And they have a strong voice in, in Brussels, uh, either in the Council or even more in the European Council. So they can play a multi-level game. Parliaments can't play that. Uh, and let's say the idea would be why can't parliaments create a kind of counterbalance, let's say multi-level game. And uh, here we don't see much. I mean, COSAC is, let's say, something where people even look at that anymore carefully. And if you find what it's written in the Lisbon Treaty, COSAC has no, no any kind of role at all. I mean, it might take uh, resolutions, but nobody needs to look at them. Uh, this is a real disappointment, and apparently both the European Parliament and the National Parliament were both on the same side, not to strengthen COSAC, which would be a place to have a mighty level cooperation among parliaments. Uh, and also, let's say what I see from the 
efforts which are always done under, let's say, the political agenda in France and Germany that the Bundestag and the Assemblée Nationale should work together and, and get together. I think there are major issues. This, as far as I see it from the outside, doesn't move much. I mean, they have meetings, even the Treaty of Aachen, they are now, let's say, mentioned, but I don't see any major impact of this cooperation. I might be wrong, because again, I'm outside. So that's the fourth point. The fifth point is perhaps more general political science. I think what uh, these elements you indicate could be used to formulate perhaps some more like a theoretical framework. And let's say here, of course, you can refer to our traditional classical theories of integration. I would perhaps even turn more to the rather traditional schools of neo-institutionalist uh, ways. That means, uh, for example, my explanation why national parliamentarians are not involved, it follows what is called the rational choice institutions. For their own career, uh, on, for, the impact, for their impact on, you, on decisions, this cooperation doesn't count. I mean, nobody will re-elect him or her because uh, she or he is active in this kind of context. Uh, and as I said before, let's say even if you formulate some positions, you never know where this ends up. So my point would be, why not use schools of uh, neo-institutionalism? And also, let's say this of sociological institutionalism. What is, what are norms which should be followed? First of all, on oversights, which you have generally as in comparison, but also for this, let's say, cooperation among national and European parliaments. The narratives are there to say, yes, they need to cooperate and or we need to cooperate with the Assemblée Nationale, etc. So there are a lot of these goodwill actions and declarations, but why, it doesn't follow very much from that. So why is this apparently a generally stated objective, but nothing happens later on? I think that's uh, very important to, to follow. Of course, nothing happens is wrong because your work shows a lot of things happening. Uh, so uh, my point is a little bit to exaggerate this issue and find out what are theories to explain. Um, you mentioned yourself at the end that many things can be explained by party interactions or you mentioned the term pre-legal factors. Uh, this is in, uh, uh, somewhere in uh, page two, uh, 212, somewhere around that. Um, I think that would be a good starting point to look closer and to extend this kind of considerations to create some kind of more general um, theory. So under which conditions do national parliaments play what kind of oversights, taking your categories, um, which I mentioned, uh, and uh, which would mean in which way this could be, perhaps be even, even improved. And here, my final word is, uh, Again, what we see is uh, what many of our studies show, there is no real convergence inside the European Union. I mean, they are all faced with the challenges of influence and trying to influence European decisions, but the structures and procedures are still very different from countries. And you mentioned yourself, uh, I like that term very much, that uh, there is nothing like one way to solve everything. There is no let's say, a simple way to really reform it because each lives under different constellations. And here, perhaps the third school of uh, neo-institutionalism comes in, that of historical, that let's say parliaments are working on past depends, on national past depends, not so much on European past depends. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Mas Wolfgang. And before I, I give the floor to Deirdre, let me remind, remind you once again that you can raise your questions through the Q&A button or through the participants raising your hand and then we can take them orally. Okay, Deidre, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Carlos. And, and thank you, Elena, for inviting me to be here this morning and for uh, gifting me your, your book, which I read with great interest. Um, so I'm happy to participate in this to give a few reflections um, on, on, on putting it perhaps in a, in a, in a wider context. 
um, as a, a non-political scientist, but also with someone with an interest in empirical work. I think also what your book, uh, so I think this, we didn't coordinate um, Wolfgang and I, but I think uh, hopefully my comments will be uh, quite supplementary to, to his. So I think what it shows as well is that there is a, a need for uh, deeper empirical work and um, you know from the point of view of researchers I think there's several uh, PhDs here um, to look actually at the practices of what happened and what happens and uh, to learn from that so that there's an interaction between um, sort of bottom up and, and, and top down. But basically, my comments are threefold. Um, one of them relates to the nature of executive power. Uh, the second is in relation to transparency. And, you know, what you throughout your book refer to as uh, fact finding um, at, in, in various places of your book, various chapters. And um, thirdly, what you refer to at the very end of the book, um, and this was before COVID, I'm, ass I'm assuming that the idea that the oversight of the executives, and I'm quoting, is a measure of parliament's ability to respond to contemporaneity. Um, and of course, the contemporaneity we're living now, we could never have envisaged at the time uh, that you wrote your you wrote those final words of your book, but I think it it also shows up um, themes in a certain way that that are relevant in the European context, but are also very much relevant and coming up in the in the national context. And we see exactly what you said in your preliminary remarks, um, how the responses to COVID also. Um, highlight, you know, it brings out pre-existing um, problems. So perhaps with that in mind, I can just make a few, as I said, three brief comments. So the first one is um, the executives, as you put it, you know, whether it's a plurality of executives or fragmented executives, as you refer to it in, in, in various parts, I think that's undoubtedly um, true, you know, we both have the political executive, the more classical approach, if you like, uh, the commission, the it, at least in the European context, the more classical approach, commission, council, European council. But then we have also this whole array of however you want to formulate it, whether it's expert executive, technocratic executives, um, uh, which is becoming uh, increasingly important. But of course, has always been part of um, the EU system in particular um, from the very beginning, but now um, in COVID times, we are seeing the, um, the preponderance of it and, and, um, and their you know, huge salience in, a, in an unclear fashion as to how it relates to um, the political um, level. So um, in terms of uh, parliamentary oversight, which of course is, is the theme of your book, um, you do discuss a little bit um, agencies um, um, and perhaps in that context, scientific advisors, etc. cetera. Um, and you do point out, um, I did write down somewhere where that was, but um, I can't find that now. You pointed out, um, in a sense, the new softer techniques. I think I, that would, uh, you didn't put it quite like that, but I think that's what you were getting at in terms of, um, I think also in, in relation to the ECB. Uh, the European Central Bank, um, the practice of calling in the, the president or the directors and questioning them and in that way exercising um, or attempting to exercise oversight. And of course, um, that also happens through budgetary means. 
um, and and that's a long-standing thing in, in in that there can be some tweaking in in, in that regard. Um, but I think it's 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 interesting to explore, and I say this uh, not as a political scientist, but I can imagine it's also interesting for political scientists to know to understand why um, this is not used more actively and 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 more almost aggressively. Um, because I think from, I remember a couple of years ago, I did some limited um, empirical work in that regard. I think it was in the context actually of the ECB and the, and the committees in that context. And the um, it was all rather, rather soft in terms of um, of of the findings and and the dialogue and 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 almost formalistic. I mean, it was a bit better than <coughs> perhaps the president of the European Council. I remember I did some sort of comparative look at different actors, but I often wonder, from the point of view of the European Parliament, you know, why doesn't it use the tools that it has and that it can use? You know. Um, and in a way, the European Parliament, in, in certain respects, can do much more than national parliaments. So I, I sort of wonder why. Also, you know, there, there are provisions, um, somewhat controversial provisions, but nevertheless, they're there and could be utilized in terms of setting up committees of inquiry. Um, this is drifting into my, my second point on, on transparency. Uh, not transparency in a narrow sense, but transparency in the sense of fact finding, of knowing who's doing what, when and how, of actually drawing that out. Um, so there are tools that the European Parliament has and could use, um, but doesn't. And my final point in that regard, so this is not, I'm not going to talk to you classically about transparency and all of that. I mean, the parliament has used transparency in certain ways, you know, in very classical ways, but there are also limited ways of bringing, uh, you know, court cases and, and, you know, winning points of principle and trying to change practice, which then in fact, um, uh, the executive institutions don't change. For example, the classical case is um, transparency on uh, legal opinions, you know, of the um, legal service. But what I find very interesting, and this again is drifting into, into the third point, so you see how these issues are interrelated on the contemporaneous situation and, uh, and the COVID response. And one of the most interesting um, responses I find, and I've also looked at some of the national um, um, parliaments as well, so I would include them in that, is the manner in which the European Ombudsman has gone about uh, conducting studies of various actors, the political actors as well. So um, I think that there, uh, she's opened inquiries into the council and its change in its rule proce of procedure and how it's operating to the European Council, et cetera. But what I find really fascinating is the way that she is pushing, uh, for example, the European Centre of Disease um, uh, Control, you know, that is responsible, uh, that is a very much an unknown entity, um, and that she has actually uh, been, uh, uh, got access to um, various documents and information just in a process by virtue of opening a case and I should say own initiative so um, and is really so quite a lot is coming out um, in in that respect also with regard to the European uh, medicines agency um, I think the European medicines agency is also a particularly interesting case because if you look back I happen to be doing that recently in the context of some other work and you look at how much it has changed in terms of its own transparency of what it will proactively reveal. It's also as a result of um, in, in dia you know, being semi-forced to by either the European Ombudsman 
or as a result of several inquiries dating basically from over the course of the last decade, but also court cases um, that competitors have brought um, pharmaceutical companies to the court seeking to limit uh, the transparency and have lost. Um, so I think, so for me, this is part of a kind of um, throughput, if you like, a throughput legitimacy sort of opening up the black box of decision making that the European Ombudsman is able to, to force out and that actually results in concrete institutional change. And I'm just wondering, you know, the European Ombudsman, and you mentioned that, I was looking at that this morning, somewhere else in your book, when you're talking about national parliaments and the role of the, uh, the Ombudsman there, that they are intertwined. Um, and somehow at the European level, they're not so much. And yet uh, the European Ombudsman is a creature of the European Parliament. You know, it's the, it, it's, um, it comes from the European Parliament in a sense, in terms of appointment and everything else. So I suppose what I'm saying is that um, I think your book, but also the COVID crisis and the combination of the two can enable us to think of a uh, reform agenda uh, in terms of using the tools we have in a deeper way. So in a sense, you, in your book, you refer to, you know, the need to have a network of parliaments, the European parliaments and the national parliaments. And yes, I think that's so, but maybe at the European level, we need, um, because of course, for certain types of European action that is necessary because of the composite nature, you know, both national and supranational, but for other bits of the European uh, integration process, it is more um, supranational and there and then the tools might be more of a combination of actors at the supranational level in terms of uh, acquiring um, executive um, it, 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 parliamentary oversight over the plural executives. So I think um, in, in, in conclusion, really, what I'm and, and what the COVID crisis also prompts me to think is that, um, you know, we're confronted yet again with the reality in an emergency situation. But, you know, we've had emergencies in the European Union also in other areas more recently, and we will undoubtedly have more. But you see how executive power is then. Um, very much takes the reins and maybe needs to, but but the almost initial instinctive reaction is for parliaments to retreat. Certainly, in the in the case of um, the pandemic, uh, they had to go remote and whatever, and it was very difficult for them to really get to grips with where the actual decisions were being taken and give, and what kind of decisions and what input to those decisions. It wasn't purely political, but it was a more uh, mixed up um, and blended phenomenon. Um, so I think it, it, it throws up, and I'd be interested in hearing your views very much on this as to, you know, in terms of learning from both your book and the crisis that we are unfortunately still in, uh, what pathways for reform uh, you could potentially uh, see that would combine the legal, but also some of the uh, informal mechanisms that we already have. So I'd like to leave it at that. And thank you once again, Elena, for writing a very stimulating book. Thank you much, Adrian. And uh, now perhaps we can give the opportunity to Elena to respond very briefly because we have got a few questions also in the in the chat. So Elena, you could address the remarks that uh, Volvan and Bessel have done in a few minutes. Then we can go also to the questions and enlarge this conversation. Elena. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you very much to, you, to, to both Dave and Wolfgang. I, I, I mean, I, I will try to answer them probably in a collective way because I mean, the points are quite the same for all the points that have been raised by Wolfgang and Deirdre. And I'm referring to the use of the yellow card, but also to the point that Deirdre the, the was raising of the oversight of agencies and independent authorities uh, of the ombudsman, whatever. Uh, well, I think that uh, when, when we need to evaluate what moves uh, parliaments to engage in the oversight relation, we should focus on two main issues. The first is procedures, because procedures do matter, and it's the first incentive. It's, uh, if a procedure is strong, then the parliament has more incentive to engage in the procedure because uh, it knows that it's rewarding the outcome, but also political incentives. So what's the outcome that MPs will gain from engaging in that mechanism? And uh, in the cases that uh, the Hydra and Volcan were mentioning, uh, we don't have really a direct political rewarding, uh, direct uh, political outcome, because when parliaments, for instance, engage in the early warning mechanism, well, there's no a direct political outcome. It's a dialogue with the commission, it's an investment in the long term, if you want, but still they need to learn how to communicate what they're doing. It's a problem of, I think, a political culture more than uh, anything else. Um, and I think that uh, to support the political incentives, we really should work uh, on the cross-party dimension, because that's what I mean, paradoxically, could encourage MPs to engage together in something that goes beyond the cleavage between majority and opposition, which is rewarding because it, it enables MP to say, I mean, we represent the Italian parliament or whatever, and we want to stay the position. And we do this in support of our government, of against our problem, government, but we say this in the interest of our citizens. That's a type of culture that probably needs to be developed. And of course it takes a time. And of course, in the, in the case of the early warning mechanism, the problem is that the procedure is really weak. So, I mean, we can work on procedure on political incentives, but the procedure in itself doesn't provide a significant outcome. Mm, because the, the, in any way, uh, on the point of the Hydra uh, on the agencies, where I really believe that this is this this would be another line of research that I really would would love to engage in. I mean, more focused. Um, because oversight of the agencies of independent authorities, uh, as we may want to, to, to call them, um, it's in between the political oversight or, or really it, it's in between the oversight of the executive and the oversight of public administration. It's in between the two. And I think that parliaments in parliamentary systems still need to learn how to perform this function. And they probably should learn more from presidential experiences because the, the, the US Congress is really strong in the oversight of regulatory agencies. And learning from, uh, from these experiences would probably give new suggestions on how to make use of existing tools, because you're right. I mean, we have many tools that already can be used by parliaments, but uh, um, the problem is uh, to, to, to find incentives to, to, to use these tools. Um, and I think that the pandemic gives quite a lot of incentives to MPs to, to use these tools. I mean, because, because we have a shift of power to experts, to clinicians, to agencies, so they really should get a concern about this. But um, you, you mentioned, of course, the activity of the home to spend, but also um, I was surprised by, by reading the report of the UK Select Committee uh, on Science and Technology, who released a, an interesting report on how the government has relied on scientific evidence to draft anti-COVID measures, which really is one example of what Parliament can do through the oversight function to say to citizens, to, to, to uh, I mean, to, to provide to citizens an informed judgment and also elements of information. So uh, these are just some examples. And the very last point is on uh, Wolfgang's uh, um, comment on interparliamentary cooperation. This has been a, a, another topic that I have tried to cover in the last few years. And yeah, 
completely right. I mean, uh, I mean, interparliamentary cooperation has not been uh, well successful so far. And I believe that there are many organizational um, problems behind this because there's a problem of um, related to the composition of interparliamentary conferences, there's no stability, uh, so there's no continuity in the work of uh, conferences. Um, there's no uh, of, there's no form of uh, um, committee work. I mean, they do work on documents on act, but they just debate. So it's they act more as a talking parliament than as a working supranational parliament. So that I think that the challenge would be to try to structure better the work of these conferences, if there's a willingness to, of course, but it cannot just be a place where to meet and every national parliament can choose MPs to send and that's not really a, a follow up. So, I mean, if we want to use this tool to make a multi-level uh, connection between MPs, then we need to think about the organization of these conferences. Mm -hmm. But I see that there are quite many questions, so yes. I'll probably stop here. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Elena. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to now to, to raise the question we have in the in the chat, and uh, I will invite also the Adria and uh, Borvan, if they want to intervene, to to jump in and to to add to the comments of Elena. So let me take the first two questions. The first one is by Foti Tsiglis from the Hellenic Parliament. And he says, technology may alter the very nature of traditional parliamentary functions, such as oversight. Does your book cover the digital transformation of oversight? Would you mind briefly discussing the topic? A small question. And uh, let me put a second one to you, which is also very small. What is the, what is the author concern about the increasing lack of oversight or control of the governments to the governments of Poland and Hungary? Also a very small question. <laughs> well, I can try to start, but I mean, I think that on um, the issue of, of technology, probably also the Adrian Volcom might say something. Well, I, I believe, but this is really my personal view, that technology is a tool available to parliaments, but it shouldn't really uh, condition the way in which they perform their functions. I mean, in my view, probably I'll, I'm a little bit too much traditionalist but uh, they should try to improve the way they perform their function using the technology, but not use the technology to change their functions or to change the outcome of their procedures. Because I think that probably this might be a, a very long-term perspective, but we still don't have the capacity to, to, to think about how the technology might change the functions and the procedures. So we are in a, an intermediate stage and I think that much of the concerns during the COVID related to the, to the use of remote meetings have been about safeguarding the standard way of uh, functioning on parliaments. And I think that this is a safe concern at the moment, that we really need to, to protect the traditional function of parliaments, making use of technologies to solve our problems. But I mean, I, I haven't really covered this issue in, in the book, and I'm sorry for this, but I mean, it was out of my remit, I would say. <laughs> Um, the second point, again, uh, this is a sphere that I really haven't covered in my book because I think that, I mean, it would uh, turn us to a completely different perspective. Uh, one thing is studying uh, parliamentary oversight in countries which derive from, well, similar tradition, we still have a solid constitutional environment. And another thing is to study parliamentary oversight in countries which have mm -hmm least toward authoritarianism. So, I mean, this would become another issue. And of course, I mean, I would be much interested to, to learn more about this, but it's, I'm sorry, not my, really my, my topic. <laughs> Good. So let me just uh, raise for you the third question that is uh, posed by Luigi Giannetti. And he says, the ex-ante oversight tools uh, have the strongest influence. Among them, the parliamentary mandates in the field of European Union affairs are playing an increasing role. Yet, the real influence of the, in the European Union legislative process depends on the influence of each government. And then he quotes you to say, as correctly Elena Grillo says, where supranational decision-making prevails over, over intergovernmentalism, the political directions and mandates adopted by national parliaments are exhausted. In my opinion, possibility of a coordinated action of parliament seems to be ineffective to fill the gaps, the black holes. On the contrary, there is pressure in some countries to reinforce the role of ex-ante parliamentary control as such. 
this process is clear where unanimity is required and intergovernmental treaties. My question is, to what extent can this increase effectiveness of ex ante oversight tools, lead countries and parliaments to prefer intergovernmental instruments like the European Stability Mechanism? <laughs> It's not an easy question. I mean, I, I, I agree with Luigi. I think that uh, national parliaments prefer uh, intergovernmental instruments because that's where they can still exercise an influence on, on the governments. And they can, down, they can do so by uh, reinforcing, of course, the ex ante tools. So if a parliament has a strong mandate system, then I mean, it is true that uh, the will of the executive will be aligned to the will of parliament in the intergovernmental meeting. Uh, and of course, as I was mentioning, we have seen many trends in this direction throughout Europe, but this uh, still doesn't solve the problem of the accountability circuit of uh, uh, intergovernmental uh, bodies, because every parliament can just oversee its own government. So, and the government answers just to, to the parliament. So it's a, a, a cultural relationship, I would say. Any, uh, a single national parliament is not able to cover the entire composition of the intergovernmental body. And this is particularly true when we have the majority rule. I mean, insofar we have unanimity rule, then we can say that national parliaments are still able to control the way in which intergovernmental institutions work. But when we have majority rule, then we have a sphere of action that is completely out of the control. And uh, that's where I think that we should probably think about other circuits of accountability, alternative probably to the confidence relationship, probably also for intergovernmental bodies, but it's really an open, an open mark. We probably still need to think about other non-confidence schemes of accountability. So asking intergovernmental bodies to give count uh, uh, as uh, agencies do before the European Parliament uh, outside a real confidence scheme. I mean, the, the European Parliament, of course, has sort of supervision, but if we want really to, to exercise an influence, we need to strengthen the supervisory powers, I think, of the European Parliament. Thank you. Um, let me just move now to the next question, which is going to be raised orally by Valentin Krelinger. Valentin, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I think. Yes, yes. Hi, uh, Valentin, hi. Hello. Uh, congratulations, Elena, on publishing your book and on having uh, such a great uh, launch event uh, with uh, Derde and uh, Wolfgang. Um, I would um, like to uh, raise a different COVID-related point on national parliaments. When, uh, when COVID-19 hit Europe, any physical meeting became too dangerous, travel impossible, and besides parliament themselves, interparliamentary cooperation uh, could also no longer work as previously. I think that is an important point. In the beginning, the meetings were just canceled, but later in the years, the working methods were adapted and video conferences were undertaken. Uh, so my first question is, does this, and I would call it uh, forced digitalization, uh, in your view and based on your analysis, uh, help to remedy, uh, remedy the shortcomings of interparliamentary corporations? Uh, I think you described them, them in great length. So this is my first question. And the second question, how does it uh, change the balance of power between national parliaments and the European parliament? Because after all, the administrative and technological capacities of national parliaments uh, vary, and they are often asked to co-chair or host interparliamentary conferences when they are, as you know from your practitioner's experience, uh, the so-called presidency parliaments. Um, yeah, thank you. Elena, please, you can respond now. 
Yeah, thank you very much to Valentin for raising this question, which it really, yeah, I mean, comes out from real politics, I, I would say. Um, well, uh, I, I agree, of course, I mean, uh, in this case, the, digitali the digital challenge and the COVID uh, has not favor uh, the practice of interparliamentary cooperation, but I would like to turn back to what I was mentioning before uh, in answer to Wolfgang. Uh, I mean, uh, if interparliamentary conferences are expected to work as big assemblies, big plenaries, then I mean, it, it's <coughs> obvious that we cannot really use digital tools to make them work properly. If we want to make them an effective means uh, of meeting, of debating, of adopting hacks, we need to turn to the style of committee work. So smaller conferences, Molly, smaller groups of experts where Hampi sent one representative, an expert of the subject involved, and this committee can probably more easily work in an informal style, so making use of digital tools. And I say this because many parliaments, and the Italian parliament is one of these, have been, uh, uh, um, have, I mean, have not adopted uh, electronic voting or remote sessions for the plenary, but they have adopted uh, remote meetings for committees. So it's easier to adapt technology to committee meetings and uh, um, than for the plenaries. And I think that this would um, offer an answer also to the second point raised by Valentin, that we, this would enable to, to overcome the uh, differences in the technological capacities between parliaments, because if it's, if it's an informal group, then it's easier to, I mean, to help on each other and to reach a positive outcome. Okay. Thank you, Elena. And uh, we have now a question from Lisa Marin, uh, and she says that is following up on, on uh, Volvan remarks on the EAWM. I think it's ESM, but I'm not totally sure whether she means EAWM or ESM. And says, lately we have tried to bridge with national members of parliament and propose analysis from the academics of the new path of migration and asylum. The new path and its measures do affect significantly national administrative levels. The impression one has is that the national parliaments are not using the room they have, nor they cooperate among each other in scrutinizing society. How can we explain that? Is it that uh, national politics and European politics are traveling on parallel lines, not converging? And I think both Elena and Golf and also, of course, Diedrich can say something about this. Thank you. Probably just just to welcome. Do you want to start? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, can... No, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Go ahead first, please. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, um, it's true that national parliaments have not properly used the holy warning mechanism to cooperate because here we always have uh, the, the cleavage between uh, parliamentary majority and the government. I mean, the, the question is the holy warning mechanism is a pro cross party tool or is it uh, a majority opposition tool? I mean, are national parliaments using the holy warning mechanism to uh, cooperate beyond the cleavage between majority opposition, or are they uh, using it to support the own governments? So I believe that the possibility to cooperate is subject to the hypothesis that national parliaments are using this tool in a cross-party mode. Otherwise, I mean, it's difficult to, to, to I mean, to uh, figure out lines of international cooperation, but uh, I mean, we can uh, imagine lines of international cooperation, but among countries which follow the same direction, which I am, have the same interest. And I think that, uh, I mean, there was a cooperation by the visit uh, national parliaments at a certain stage. I mean, this confirms that they were following the lines of the home governments. And they were also able to cooperate, but in a more restricted area. Well, do you want to add to this? Or yeah, I would yeah. like to add something. We might follow a little bit a Montesquieu bias here, that we think parliaments are autonomous in their own way. But 
in parliamentary system, and the French might be an exception to that, there's this close relationship between governments and the majority of parliaments, even if we have in some countries minority governments. Uh, so let's say I, I have the impression quite often that uh, members of the parliaments are then considering their partners, if they are in the same uh, party like the government, uh, to deal with what they think is important and not act as the government, uh, as the parliament, I'm sorry, as the parliament in balance with the government. So let's say the close links and confidence building, uh, uh, trust building, which you mentioned in your work between uh, governments and the majority of parliaments really make some of the autonomous action a little bit difficult. And I think uh, listening to some experiences with the early warning system, this was a blockage. Why should we do something which might, uh, let's say, be not positive for our government? So let's say uh, we trust our government and we don't make any move which might be seen as not uh, the same position in Brussels as our government has. So it might uh, weaken the position of the government in Brussels if national parliaments might show a different position. Now, I don't know if this is always the case. And as we know in Portugal, for example, there are much more early warning um, uh, messages uh, or early warning actions. So we need to look that a little bit closer. Uh, but again, I think one point is parliaments are closely linked with governments and governments closely linked with parliaments. Thank you. Um, we have uh, still a few questions, so I'm going to close at this point the, the opportunity to raise new questions, and I will take the three that are pending so far, which are by uh, Cristina Fassone, by Francesco Luciano and Luciano, and uh, by Thomas Christensen. So let me start with uh, Cristina's question, who congratulates you on the book, and um, and thanks for the interesting seminar. And she raises a couple of questions. The first. Regarding the evolution of parliamentary oversight in the last decades and in prospect, how do you see the role of committees and the plenary develop? It seems that may be even as a consequence of the participation of European Union Affairs and on the need for more specialization, the scrutiny of in committees has become crucial to obtain information and to hold the executives into account compared to the plenary, much more focus on both on voting. So that will be the first question, this relation from plenary to committees. Second question from Cristina Fassone, regarding post-legislative scrutiny, which appears to be weak in many parliaments, which incentives would need to be created for members of parliament and political parties to engage in the exercise? Maybe be partisan committees or value to role of backbenchers? So, I mean, thanks, Cristina. And you're right. I mean, I think that oversight depends on a combination of committee and plenary tools. And I see three levers uh, of engagement. The first level is information, finding, and this uh, requires the committee level. The second level of oversight is deliberation, which can be done at the, at the committee or at the plenary level. And the, and the, sorry, the second level is discussion, uh, and it can be done at committee or uh, plenary level. And the third level is deliberation, which usually is at the plenary level because it gives visibility. So I think that national parliaments in general need to combine these levels and the committee or the plenary uh, rooms to, 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 to use uh, these mechanisms according to the outcome that they are expecting to, to achieve. Uh, and I think that anyway for European affairs, I mean, committees are really strategic because it's a work on documents on, on, a, on, a, on a very detailed and focused policy, policy issue. And on post-legislative scrutiny, uh, I think that I see many possible incentives uh, to be created with MPs. Uh, first of all, I believe that sunset clauses in legislation might be a strong incentive. So when, uh, I mean, in the legislation, we, we put one clause saying that in two years or three years, Parliament is expected to provide a report on the implementation of that piece of legislation. Uh, the second incentive, as you mentioned, Christina, might be the, the creation of bipartisan committees because post-legislative scrutiny requires a bipartisan approach, a cross-party approach. And the third incentive is the role of administration. I mean, we are doing any search with Thomas Christensen and Nicola Luto on, on this issue. And I believe that parliamentary administration are strategic to provide the informative support and the expertise to parliament to engage in the post-legislative scrutiny. 
Thank you. We have now the question by Francesco Luciano. What kind of relationship is there between oversight function and other parameter functions in a comparative perspective? And how this relationship has changed in the last few years due to European integration, especially regarding budgetary procedures? Again, and this is a huge topic. I, mean, uh, I, I as I was mentioning, I believe that the introduction of the European economic governance has determined a shift of the focus of uh, uh, the budgetary activity of Parliament from legislation to the oversight. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, you need to consider that national parliaments came from different traditions because the Italian parliament was really strong in budgetary legislation and weak in the oversight. The, 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 the British parliament was the opposite, was very strong in, in, budget, in, in the oversight of budget, but weak in, in budgetary legislation. So of course, I mean, you need to uh, uh, frame the statement in a nuanced picture. But anyway, I believe that the European semester has really encouraged uh, national parliaments to, uh, to set the fundamental directions before any decision is taken. And that's really the point. But again, what's really missing, I think, is the follow-up. I mean, national parliaments are not really engage, engaged in uh, the implementation of budget. I mean, the, the, the European parliament is another thing. I mean, I think that the, the, the discharge procedure is, I mean, a really powerful uh, uh, procedure, but this is lacking at national level. So that's, again, another field where national parliaments can learn from the European parliament. Thank you. And we have uh, last but not least the, the question by Thomas Christiansen, uh, which is focusing on a very important and relevant practical dimension. Uh, the question is about the mismatch between the political and administrative logic in parliamentary oversight. On the administrative front, parliaments need more resources, capacity, etc. Yet at the time of growing political polarization, it may become increasingly difficult to obtain the political support for such instruments. In other words, government majorities might, see, might be seek to suppress rather than support great, greater scrutiny by parliaments. How do you respond to this? Well, I agree with Thomas. I mean, of course, I mean, government is not always interested in supporting parliamentary oversight, but that's where the accountability discourse of the Westminster tradition comes in help. Because I mean, if we put this, if we stress not so much the role of parliament in controlling, but the duty of government to answer, and this is again a problem with civic culture, then it's an interest of government to come before parliament to give explanation, because that's the way of reaching a wider audience. Of course, I mean, what we should ask governments is not to use the social media for announcing the measures or for explaining the measures, but to use parliament. I mean, that, that's the really the cultural uh, evolution. But in, in a medium long-term perspective, I think that um, to structure uh, the oversight resources of parliament, um, we need to uh, invest, to, 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 well, to, to invest on a cross-party agreement. I mean, in, we need to invest on the role of, pub, of parliamentary administration because this gives view to, to, to the capacity of parliament to strengthen oversight as an institution. And, uh, I, but I was mentioning, I mean, the, the European Union has had a positive effect in these regards because it, it has widened the cleavage between majority and opposition and has given incentives to parliament to look beyond the, 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 the interest of the moment. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I think we are really at the end of this uh, wonderful seminar. I want to thank all the participants and also, of course, the Adrian Borvan for this, their very uh, insightful and uh, useful views on your MOOC. And of course, Elena, thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity to discuss such a interesting and compelling uh, subject. So thank you very much, everyone. And I wish you a very nice uh, rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, thank you. <laughs>